Welcome to our OU Exploration Series. I'm Catherine Lehman. I will be your moderator this evening. Tonight, you will hear a presentation by OU faculty member Andrea Ace. Following the presentation, there will be a live question and answer session. To ask a question, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, not the chat feature. You can type your questions at any time and they'll be answered following the presentation. I would like to welcome our special guest, President Ora Peskovitz, joining us tonight. Ora, we know you have so many requests for your time, so we're honored that you're spending some of that time with us this evening. Whenever we have a presentation with a guest speaker, there is a reminder that we like to give. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect policy, official policy, or position of Oakland University. Oakland University fully supports the First Amendment. I would like to introduce our host for the evening, Brendan Crudell. Brendan is an associate professor of film studies and production at OU. His research focuses on the intersection of media and urban studies, an area in which he has published widely, not wildly, widely. <laughs> Sorry for that, Brendan. He is the co-editor of two books, The Festivals, History, Theory, Method, Practice, and The Rutledge Companion to Media in the City. And one of the founding editors of Mediapolis, A Journey of Cities and Culture. He is a former Fulbright, Fulbright Fellow and lives with his wife and son in Ferndale. Brendan, are you with us? I'm here. I'm wild and I'm happy to be here, Catherine. Thank you for the introduction. Great. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. Um, this should prove to be an exciting evening. I'm so happy to be here with my dear colleague, Andrea Ice. Uh, let me first start by introducing Professor Ice. Uh, Andrea is a distinguished professor and the director of film studies and production in the Department of English. Uh, she taught her first course here at Oakland in 1983 in the art and art history department, and she moved into the English department in 2013 to teach film. Her short art films, mostly shot in Greece, focus on reinterpreting Greek myths and plays. Her art and films have been exhibited internationally, including solo exhibitions in Paris and Athens, and screenings in Venice, Rome, Athens, Edinburgh, and Scotland. Uh, with that, I have the distinct pleasure of turning it over to Andrea for our presentation for this evening. Please take it away. Thank you for that introduction. I'm so excited to be here tonight. As well as being an OU professor, I am a filmmaker steeped in both classical Hollywood film and art film. I grew up watching Hollywood movies on late night TV with my mother, but I was educated in the world of art films with bachelor's and master's degrees from art schools, not film schools. I consider myself an art filmmaker. There is no single definition for what an art film is. Visual and formal aspects are more obvious and critical to the creation and impact of art films. On the other hand, narrative, dialogue, and action form the core of traditional Hollywood films. Visual and formal aspects were not ignored but they are more at the service of narrative. Our filmmakers tend to create more personal visions, take more extreme chances in their cinematic choices and push their viewers harder intellectually. I'll talk about significant differences between Hollywood films and art films. And then I'll undercut my own points by showing you how they are closer than you think. Art film approaches have now seeped or at times flooded into commercial film and television. Some techniques seem radical, experimental, innovative, and disruptive years ago. Complex and perplexing narratives broke Hollywood rules. These are familiar now to audiences, even if they've never seen an art film. It is hard to even categorize some filmmakers as in one or the other world. Now let's get into the details, starting with who makes these films and how are they produced? Hollywood films are studio-driven, mass-market films, blockbusters with huge budgets. They are made with large crews with specifically differentiated jobs. 
They present story types in genres with familiar narrative arcs, westerns, film noir, sci-fi, rom-coms, and they're shown in commercial theaters. Art films are independently made with no studio backing or funding. In early days, they were also low budget. This is not universally true anymore. They were originally made by artists from other media like painting or sculpture or photography. They are made in individualized styles, though many have conceptual similarities. Art filmmakers are often their own writers, directors, producers, cinematographers, editors, even actors. I'm all of those for my films. And art films are shown in small art house cinemas or in even less formal settings, such as the gallery or someone's living room. But today, there are also many smaller independent studios. These studios tend to make films that could be considered art films, but some of them get shown in larger commercial theaters. Increasingly, Hollywood films are franchises that go on for many, many films. There are 27 movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, with their directors repeating their greatest hits or stylistic approaches. Art films are generally unique. They may not fit a genre, or the story might not be a traditional narrative. Because they are exploring and experimenting, filmmakers' films can be very different from one to the next. One critic said of French New Wave filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard that each film he made was a bizarrely different species. But then again, in Hollywood, there is Steven Spielberg. From E.T. to Jaws, from The Color Purple to Raiders of the Lost Ark, from Schindler's List to Jurassic Park. Which, of course, leads into the director's role and impact. Hollywood has big studios. Many studio films used to be made by journeyman directors, nearly anonymous and interchangeable makers of corporately controlled stories. Art films were made by auteurs, directors who were the real creative source of the film, and critical interest in the films circled around the directors. The French New Wave of Jean-Luc Godard, Alain René, Francois Truffaut, and more were film scholars and film critics, and interestingly, they loved Hollywood film. But Hollywood had its own auteurs, according to the French New Wave filmmakers, who were inspired to make films by Orson Welles and Alfred Hitchcock. Some contemporary auteurs include Sofia Coppola and Wes Anderson. The Sundance Film Festival, which started in 1984 as a showcase for independent filmmakers, was for low-profile, small-budget films. It gave art films a larger, broader audience. Many directors went on from Sundance to Hollywood. Quentin Tarantino, Darren Aronofsky, Steven Soderbergh, the Coen brothers. By the 2000s, though, Sundance became a Hollywood studio, corporate-based purchasing market. Sundance has been working to reestablish opportunities for small independent filmmakers, but what did the overwhelming Hollywood corporate influence at Sundance do to art filmmakers? Are they still art filmmakers if they have an $85 million budget, like indie art filmmaker Steven Soderbergh for Ocean's 13? It depends on whether you think art films must be made by starving artists. There are definitely other elements that go into making an art film. But not all art filmmakers are at ease with Hollywood. Well-known art filmmaker David Lynch made his first feature film, Eraserhead, in 1977 for $10,000, but by 2001 had a $15 million budget for Mulholland Drive. And he stopped directing feature films five years later. He said, films that were doing well at the box office weren't the things that I want to do. I'll get to the art of art film rather than the money, but a few more aspects first. The role of the viewer. With Hollywood films, you can sit back and be entertained or scared or sad or whatever emotion, but you don't have to work at watching it or work at understanding the film. Art films require an active viewer who definitely has to work to understand the film. Often it is quite difficult or even impossible 
An example, Elaine Renee's Last Year at Marion Bad. It has a complex plot that is basically incomprehensible, but fascinating in my opinion. Art films can also reward active viewing with unexpected insights, beauty, emotional depth. Also from Renee, Hiroshima Mon Amour. It is a fascinating, sorrowful, and emotional meditation on the horrors of war, on the vagaries of memory, and on impossible loves. And then there is the Hollywood art split personality. Christopher Nolan is firmly entrenched in Hollywood filmmaking, making huge blockbusters, though with some art film touches. Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, Interstellar, Dunkirk. However, his films Memento and Inception are definitely more ensconced in what we'll talk about next. Art films love of nonlinear narrative tangles, mental gymnastics, and endings that are open to interpretation. One critic said that Nolan can jam your gray matter into a knot. Which brings us to the next key issue, narrative style. Hollywood mostly uses linear narratives, beginning, middle, end, clear plots. Even flashbacks happen within a structure that explains their role. But what about Hitchcock? He had twists, turns, memories, dreams, imaginings, flashbacks, characters who aren't who you think they are, and your understanding of the storyline changes. We'll come back to Hitchcock in a minute. Art films often use nonlinear narratives. Godard said that a story should have a beginning, a middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order. The films often feature subjective narration, which is open to interpretation and often leads the viewer astray. Many have wandering, almost plot-free narratives. A push towards realism over the artifice of narrative led filmmakers to favor handheld camera work, natural light, and improvised dialogue. Now, on to editing style. Hollywood film is constructed largely with continuity editing, which is deliberately seamless, even basically invisible. You don't even notice the majority of cuts. It preserves the illusion of a continuous time and space. The rules are meant to ensure that editing does not confuse or disorient the viewer. A Hollywood film can vary from having 1,000 to 3,000 shots. Consider how hard it would be to concentrate on the story if you noticed each cut between the shots. Art film features discontinuity editing. It is a deliberately visible style which almost gleefully pulls viewers out of believing in the film world, reminding them constantly that the film is constructed. Art films want you to notice the cuts. For example, a technique that was once radical and is now common, jump cuts. Jump cuts are cuts between two shots that seem continuous, same setting, characters, visual framing, but some portion of the time in between the two shots is cut out, resulting in a jolt of different positions of a character within the frame or a different time of day. The first jump cut was in George Melies' film, The Vanishing Lady, in 1896. His camera jammed and ruined some of the film. Splicing the film back together created a jump cut. Méliès quickly began to use the jump cut deliberately as a special effect to create magic. Maya Deren, known as the mother of the American avant-garde in film, used jump cuts extensively as a more emotional signal. The most famous jump cut in art film are those of Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless. According to one story, Godard's jump cuts happened because the film was too long. So he cut one person visually out of the shot, reverse shot conversation while trying to maintain some rhythm. Here is a version without subtitles so that you can concentrate on that sound and rhythm. Hélas, hélas, hélas. 
J'aime une fille qui a une très jolie nuque, de très jolis seins, une très jolie voix, de très jolis poignets, un très joli front, de très jolis genoux. Mais qui est là It's hard to imagine now how radical Godard's jump cuts were when the film was released in 1960, because now jump cuts even show up in TV commercials. Hollywood film editing has a rhythm of cuts that are largely determined by the narrative. Who is speaking? What are they looking at? When someone leaves a room? Rhythmic editing is not dependent on narrative and is often used in art films to create a meaning separate from any storyline. But not every filmmaker follows the conventions exactly. Action films almost always break continuity conventions. Despite being highly constructed, action sequences aim to better express the reality and intensity of action, and audiences are appreciative. Hollywood films clearly signal changes such as flashbacks or dreams. They start with dissolves, fades to black, wavy lines, so that the viewer does not get confused or lost as to where they are in time and in the story. Art films feature fragmentation and radical shifts of time and place that happen abruptly with no dissolves or fades. Flashbacks might be dreams, dreams might be reality, Nothing is certain, and some shifts might never be explained. Which brings us to the next key issue, certainty versus ambiguity. Hollywood films have endings that are unambiguous. There is no question about what happened. They may have ambiguities along the way, but they are resolved. The famous Hollywood ending, which was parodied to great effect in art filmmaker Robert Altman's The Player. Art films revel in uncertainty, ambiguity, and unclear endings. Elaine Renee's Last Year at Marion Bad. Did they meet last year at Marion Bad? Were they lovers? Or did they ever meet at all? What are they doing at Marion Bad? Is that other man her husband? Do any of them leave together in the end? Good luck with trying to determine answers on any of that. Even the director and writer disagreed. But Hollywood is not always about a Hollywood ending. Consider Robert Redford's 2013 film, All is Lost. One actor film, hardly any dialogue, can't tell if he lives or dies at the end. A poll of viewers showed that they were strongly decided in almost equally divided numbers on one result or the other because they didn't like leaving the theater not knowing. Now you're probably thinking, what about the art? Starting this time with art film. As befitting its name, art styles impact the design and narratives of art films. Robert Wien's Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, 1920, German Expressionism, The Outer World Expresses Inner Turmoil. Germaine Dulac's The Smiling Madame Boudet, 1923, Impressionism and feminism, slow motion distortions, significant framing to express emotional content. Michelangelo Antonioni's Red Desert, 1964, color as representation of a character's inner world, which also appears in Hollywood films. A polluted green river, an intensely red wall, and more radically, painting everything on location including all of a fruit vendor's fruit and the wall he sits in front of, a dull gray. You can imagine the main character's emotions. Back to Hollywood film, Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious, 1946. In this clip, notice the obvious techniques, rhythms of cuts, zooms, blurred focus, warped images, and the surrealistic feel. Care for some more brandy, Arthur? No, no, thank you. I uh, never drink more than one brandy, and even this is sometimes too much. I just finished my coffee. No, that is. Oh, but that's a lit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, perhaps uh, uh, Alex is right, my dear child. When you are young, rest is the best doctor. And if you lie still for a few days, reading, 
relaxing, forgetting all your troubles. It might be as well as uh, medicine or seer. And when I come back, you will be all well, making us all very happy once more. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I want to go to bed, if you know. Pain again, darling? I'm sorry to complain again. Shall I take you up to the May I help you, my dear? Some hot water, maybe? No, no, please don't bother. I'll be all right. If you better in the morning, I insist you call it doctor. I don't like the way she looks at us. art film to finish up with just a few I want to bring to your attention. Stylization, symmetry, an abundance of color, visuals as memories. Wes Anderson movies are clearly Wes Anderson movies. Alexander Sokharov's 2002 Russian Ark, a 99-minute film shot in a single continuous take. Alejandro Iñárritu's 2014 Birdman, or the unexpected virtue of ignorance. A 119 minute film with only 16 visible cuts, very long takes and flowing camera work that follows characters in highly choreographed and specifically timed movements. Abel Gantz, a French art filmmaker, was incredibly innovative and experimental with his 1927 film, Napoleon. He used three cameras, three screens, three projectors, sometimes showing epic widescreen shots, sometimes two or three different images tinted different colors. He also used extremely fast cutting, underwater cameras, kaleidoscopic images, split screens, mosaic shots, and incredible choices for how to move the camera, such as putting it high on a rope pulley system that swooped down into the shot and then up out of it. MGM ended up buying his film and cut it drastically in length and only showed the central image of the three and then stopped showing it at all. It was restored in 1981 after 20 years of work by film historian Kevin Brownlaw. On March 14, 1981, Abel Gantz attended the Midwest premiere of Kevin Brownlaw's five and a half hour restoration of Napoleon at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. To my joy, I was in the audience that day. And finally, two images to let sit for a minute as we go to our question and answer period. Andrea, what a quick costume change. <laughs> Very funny. Yes. Good to see you. And uh, thank you for that wonderful uh, lecture. It was really, um, it was really great to be able to not only see you uh, through my computer screen, but also the uh, clips that you're bringing in and the examples gave me a lot to think about. Um, I had a couple of questions that I wanted to toss at you before uh, we open this up to our audience tonight. But before I ask these questions, I want to invite our audience to please submit your questions via the chat. Um, we'll be monitoring that and I'll be relaying the questions into Andrea so that she can uh, speak to what you're interested in. Um, one of the things I'm interested in asking you, Andrea, uh, has to do with an origin story of sorts uh, to reference the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You talk about uh, your own experience growing up watching films with your mother as being something that was formative to your own uh, coming into being a filmmaker and a film professor. Uh, I'd love to hear more about this time spent with, the, spent with your mom and what is it that you're watching and what are some of those titles that you remember from those childhood years that stick with you 
till now. Okay. Well, um, I was born in New York City and grew up in New York and New Jersey, and and the closeness to New York City meant that uh, we had lots of television stations that were showing movies from the 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, I was not alive in the 30s and 40s, I will say, but uh, I learned to love those films, and um, and my mother just adored them. And so we would watch late into the night on, on weekends, particularly not on school days. But um, all right. we watched a lot of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers musicals. Uh, you know, I've seen, I think, every one of theirs. And then there were, you know, the classics with, with uh, Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman and Humphrey Bogart and Grace Kelly and I, you know, all the, the Hollywood movie stars. And I particularly remember the ones where there were the, um, they, with, that had incredible speed in the dialogue, like the Philadelphia story. Oh, sure, yeah. My Girl Friday and, you know, those, those kinds of things. We, I'm sure we watched dramatic films as well, but comedies and musicals were the, the main films we watched. It's funny you say that because I was thinking as you were, you know, you sort of begin with this, a binary distinction that you don't really have a, any intention of leaving as a binary. And, you know, the, the talk is to establish that this is much more of a continuum than a binary. As I was watching this again, I was thinking, uh, I mean, you talk about Abel Gantz and how in a way this continuum has always existed. Napoleon was a hugely expensive film to make and that's why uh, MGM got involved. But Busby Berkeley, the musicals that he's choreographing in the thirties are, avant-garde masterpieces it just yeah. so happens that they're in the middle of these hollywood musicals right but you watch the filmmaking you say this is incredibly formalist filmmaking that's just happening you know in the space of a musical and, and people love it i think it's mm -hmm. a really good remember reminder that this false distinction that art and hollywood need to mean also popular and unpopular is totally yeah. unsustainable when we look at musicals um so then I want to put you on the spot here because you talked about a film that for me is the reason that I'm a filmmaker, a, a film professor. And that's Last Year at Marion Bad. The, seeing Last Year at Marion Bad was like a lights on moment for me. Was there a film either that you were watching with your mother or that you were watching when you were coming up through art school that the lights went on for you and you said, this is it. I need to be a filmmaker. I need to be a film professor. Well, I think it would be a toss up between last year at Marienbad and La Jete, Chris Martin, uh, yeah. La Jete, which was the basis for 12 Monkeys or sort of the basis for it. But uh, that was the most astounding film to me. It's a, just a short film made almost exclusively out of still images. It's a science fiction uh, film takes place in the the past, the present, and the future, and so any any film that broke things up like that was, was always fascinating to me. And so I think those were those were the key ones. So it's interesting that we have this one of the same. <laughs> yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I've known Andrew for a very long time, and yet I did not know that we both had a similar fondness for last year at Marion Bad. She's probably more surprised about that than I am. Actually, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and I will say that um, because we had to do a written thesis as well as an art thesis in, in, for my master's, and I wrote mine on New Way Film, and last year at Marion Bad was a major aspect of my thesis. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, it's still, yeah, I went to see it in a theater not too long ago. I'm, I love that it's been restored and that we can still go to see it in theaters, and also its mystery is still enduring after so many years, just the, the questions and the dresses. Um, and so um, it's, it's a beautiful film. Uh, I can see there are questions rolling in here. So I wanna make sure that we get to these. Uh, and the first one for you is, when did you make your first art film? 
Mm, a long time ago. <laughs> um, it was in 1978, I think. Yeah. 1978? Yeah. I had gone back to school. I already had a degree. I had a degree in classics and archaeology and had gone to a year of graduate school and that before I turned away from that and thought, well, I'll go back to school, <laughs> see if there's something else. And I, I went in photography um, and I didn't really know anything about art film. I didn't know anything about film criticism. Um, and so I learned at Minneapolis College of Art and Design that there was this whole world of other kinds of films out there. And my first film was not, well, you might have called it an art film, but it was not good because I came from a photo background. So I made a film about a sculpture which doesn't move. And I didn't move my camera and there were no people in it. So nothing moved. And my professor had to tell me, you know, this is ocean <laughs> pictures, <laughs> you know, um, which opened up a great deal for me. So it was after that that I started making art film. I could say. Very good. Um, let's see here. The next question. When it comes to these stylistic techniques like jump cuts and such being a part of art films, where does the line become blurred between art film and commercial or mainstream Hollywood film? Mm. This is a tough question here. So thank you, anonymous attendee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you put me on the spot here. Well, the thing is that I think it's become blurred so much these days that you can't see those distinctions because it's not just between art film and Hollywood film, but as I mentioned earlier, sometimes it's in commercials too. <laughs> it's everywhere. And so... I think that there was a lot more separation in say the 50s, late 50s, when the new wave filmmakers were making their films, even though they were never that rigid of distinctions, but the distinctions were more in the, the kind of stories they told and the way they told them. Um, but you would never have thought when Godard came out with Breathless, which was actually, and Belmondo was a Humphrey Bogart type in that film. So there was the, the influence of uh, Hollywood film on that film. And uh, it, no one would have ever thought that those jump cuts would end up in Hollywood film. And now we don't even, we don't even notice or, or we might notice, but we don't, uh, we're not shocked by it or surprised by it. So I don't think there is really a, as much of a line anymore. Although I think the commercial aspects of film are still different from certain art filmmakers who, um, who want to back away from that. I mean, even Steven Soderbergh is going back to making small art films and then I'll go and make something that has a budget of $85 million, but he he keeps going back to art films, which are lower budget and he has more control over. So I don't know if that answers the question, but. Yeah, yeah, I think when you talk about Soderbergh, I think about John Cassavetes, right? And like mm -hmm. the old myths of him going to make Rosemary's Baby or something. So he had enough money in his pocket to go make movies that he actually wanted to make. And yeah. Isn't, yeah. In the American context, that's always the problem, right? That our, our commercial cinema is financed by private industry. In a lot of other countries, including France at that time, of the new wave, there was government funding available for filmmakers to make their films. And so there was certain pressures that maybe weren't felt so acutely by the filmmakers like Renee and them that we're talking about. But yeah. Um, what is the film that you are most proud of that you have worked on? <laughs> uh, Hi, Steve. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess um, it's always your last one, you know, the most recent one that you finished. And I just finished 
a film in December called Iphigenia Breathes, and I shot it in Greece, and um, it's a retelling of the story of Euripides' uh, Iphigenia in Aulis, but uh, turning the uh, turning the story around so that Iphigenia takes uh, control over her own life rather than Agamemnon putting her to death. And um, the Trojan War never happens as a result. So that's, that's what I'd say I'm most proud of. But, you know, I like some of the other ones too. <laughs> uh, okay, now we've... we've you're getting a lot of questions, Andrea. So I'm going to okay. throw these quickly at you here to okay. see which which sticks. All right, Hitchcock films. Do you yeah. want to say that Hitchcock films are art films or Hollywood films? Is there a distinction comparable to that in uh, literature between the one that we're making between Hollywood and art film? Well, uh, there were new ways. Uh, novelists and Roguier who who wrote uh, last year at Marion Bad was a novelist and so he was making he was writing novels that that were not necessarily commercially successful and and twisted your brain to read but um so I would say there there definitely is a similarity in that between that and, and more commercial novels um was I supposed to say something about the films too? Uh, we got so much to say that I think we will we'll press on. Um, all, right, all, right. all right, how about Ingmar Bergman? Um, how does he fit into this, this pantheon that you're developing here? Well, for me, I, I call him an art filmmaker. Um, you know, and not everybody might agree with me on a lot of the things I said tonight, but um, <laughs> I would call him an art filmmaker. Um, oh, here's one from uh, uh, a guest who wants to know if you could talk a little bit more about the use of split screen. So you talked about uh, Abel Gans's use of split screen in Napoleon, but uh, our guest remembers vaguely a bunch of films using split screen techniques, perhaps in the 1970s, and doesn't remember seeing this technique used more recently. Wonders if you could talk some about it. Well, it was actually pretty popular in Hollywood films. Um, uh, the one that sticks out to me the most, I'm sure there are other good examples, but it was Bye Bye Birdie. <laughs> um, and uh, the thing is that it would be, and, and some of the, the um, Darth Day films would have split screens. They would be understandable though. They would be, organized like two people talking on the phone or two people in two different locations that were, you know, arguing with each other or something or, or thinking of each other or something like that. So it was always explained in Hollywood films. And in a lot, like in Abel Gantz's film, sometimes you, you really had to work to figure out what was going on in each of those split screens. So it was done with different intent and different, a different experience for the viewer. Um, I'm sure that there are examples currently, but I'm blanking. <laughs> so. I mean, I, I think about how when we, we shift in the 90s to nonlinear editing and then in the 2000s to digital cinematography, that really reinvigorates the practice of the split screen, if only because it's now much easier, uh, frankly, to do than it ever had been before. And so we start to see uh, experimentations with split screen in the last 20 years, maybe. Um, I'm thinking of a Mike Nichols film, the name of which is slipping my mind at the moment, but, uh, you know, yeah. the attempt to keep synchronous action in different frames yeah. and stuff. And then there's also something like time code. Yes. There are four <clears throat> different um, uh, boxes of that, everything that's going on in each of them was shot at the same time as each other and, and, but with a different camera. And so it's four stories going on at the same time. And eventually they start intersecting with each other. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting example. Um, so one of our guests would like to think about how this uh, this idea of art and um, and commerce, if we want to call it distinction, might travel across national boundaries. And is asking whether you might be able to talk about this in the context of Bollywood. I don't know if this is something you can talk about in the context of Bollywood, but I'll put the question to you all the same. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I would say there's a lot of experimentation and energy in editing that happens in Bollywood. So um, I haven't thought about it in the in consideration of art film, but I think that it it's probably could be linked in certain ways to the kinds of experimentations that were happening in other art films. As it happens, I'm preparing my lecture for Indian cinema tomorrow in our world history course. And um, I mean, actually that dynamic is very similar, I think, because you have art filmmakers in India who are very much in conversation with international art cinema movements like you know, realism and stuff, mm -hmm. who are working at the same time as the huge commercial filmmakers are. And so um, actually you might say more so than any other country, that dynamic is probably the sim similar in the US and in India. Uh, mm -hmm. Now the question that I, I know everybody has been thinking about and I've been holding off on asking you uh, for some time so that you have uh, uh, a chance to think on it. The two photos that you end with, um, yeah. I was happy to see them, uh, but I'm sure there were some of our guests who were scratching their heads. I wonder if you might speak to, uh, first, the ocean ending. What is the ocean ending and what's the reference to there? Okay, well, that's from a film called Film About a Woman Who, dot, 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 which is one of my favorite titles by Yvonne Rainer, who is a, a dancer and choreographer, similar to the way Maya Darren was also a dancer and choreographer. Um, and, uh, it's it's a complex film. It's it, it it pushes you and doesn't explain things and is is very ambiguous, and it it plays around with ideas of of what you think of contemporary culture and and political issues and and then this to me is like it's it's Yvonne Rainer's nod to Hollywood. It's like you know, you could have that Hollywood ending, you could have that ocean ending, which the film does not. And, um, and it's, it's ironic, it's cynical, it's um, also a little bit of an appreciation of Hollywood film without going overboard. It's, um, it's the way we like films to end when we're talking about Hollywood, but she's not going to end it that way. So it, she gives you that little bit of it and then, you know, and then it goes away. And then the other image is um, from a Godard film. I, Godard is not actually one of my favorite filmmakers, but I seem to have put him into this presentation quite a lot because he is important. Um, and he has great examples, but that um, she's watching uh, the the Joan of Arc film by Dreyer, and and she actually I had at one point I had two images up there, one from the Dreyer film and one from the Godard film, and they, the the actresses are in exactly the same pose with the tears in their eyes. And so she's replicating what's happening in another film that she is supposed to be watching while we watch her. And these, these complexities that the art filmmakers put into their film and yet could comment on other films all the time and, and, and send you back into film history or send you towards the, the uh, traditional endings in thinking about like one of the things that art filmmakers do is they think a lot about other films. And that's a lot of why the new wave filmmakers appreciated Hollywood film so much is they really studied it and thought about it and thought about the, the directors and the, the experiments that were happening. And if you think of Citizen Kane, it was incredibly experimental 
and um, and Hitchcock, which we may think of him for more for psycho type films, but I thought Notorious was amazing in some of the things he did. So um, that was a complicated and um, squirrely kind of answer to that, but there it is. Yeah, thank you very much. And you, now that you steered it back around to Hitchcock, you were talking about the new wave novelist before. If memory serves, I think that he adapted Vertigo from one of those novels as well. Um, which is again yeah. one of these really um, formally audacious films. I mean, it, it's a deeply creepy, also, but <laughs> yeah. a reminder of um, just how false this distinction is that you're talking about yeah. here, and uh, how how it's on a continuum. Um, we'll pause here to say. Uh, guests you're all out there and we can't see you but we do invite you to uh, submit your questions into the chat we've uh, got about 10 minutes more for questions um and uh the next one uh is one that's near and dear to my heart i'd i'd love to hear you talk some about restoration our guest asks uh especially for the film that took 20 years to restore and really I assume this is a reference to Napoleon, if, if you mm -hmm. could talk some. And ladies and gentlemen who are out there, you should know that Andrew being in the presence of Abel Gantz watching Napoleon would be like the equivalent of sitting with Miles Davis listening to him play the trumpet for you. So that's an amazing story. And I didn't actually know that. So I now feel through secondhand that I have some like closer experience with genius. So this is really <laughs> exciting. I'm eager to hear the story. Yes. Well, now I've lost track of what the, the question is. Restoration. Uh, restoration. And, <laughs> I mean, the particular story of Kevin Brownlow's restoration of that film yes. is uh, yeah. incredible. But uh, I um, think our guest is also more generally interested in what film restoration is. Well, um, it, it depends on what the problems with the film were, what the restoration actually consists of. But um, it's... Uh, taking films that have uh, lost their, the quality of the image over the years or have, um, you know, have, have, been, have been spliced together in bad ways. I mean, early splicing, you could see the, the, the actual tape that spliced, kept the, the film together. And um, so trying to get rid of things like that and to make them more stable so that they will last. Um, there's a lot of uh, very unstable early nitrate based films that are disintegrating. And so stabilizing them, maybe sometimes if they can't be stabilized, copying them so that they could still exist. Um, finding the parts of Napoleon was incredibly hard. Part of his process was actually trying to find all the parts that he knew were in the original film because MGM had cut it up so badly, cut several hours out of it because it's five and a half hours. And, and um, so uh, there was a lot of detective work to find uh, copies of it that might allow him to restore sections of it. And uh, he also had to do a lot of work on, on where was the tinting and what, how, how was the tinting used in the original, um, which was often an important part of the storyline, the narrative. It's not just those, you know, the eagles with the red and blue and so it made the, the French flag, but um, also there's a, a, you know, a a flag that is just tinted red in one um, one scene, which it happens in Potemkin, all in the mm -hmm. film as well, Battleship Potemkin. And so um, it was it was obviously a labor of love for him to spend that long of a time on one film, but it is an incredible film. And I think that it, uh, it deserved that attention. I don't know that I would have been able to give it 20 years of attention, <laughs> but um, I was very glad that Brownlow did and, um, and gave us back a masterpiece. It is truly a masterpiece. And um, 
Although Avant Guns would be not very interested in talking too much to the audience during that, <laughs> after that screening. Um, he still was there. And that was pretty amazing because he 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 died maybe three or four weeks. Shortly after. thereafter, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and as I understand it, that was one of the real strokes of luck for Brownlow was that he got a chance to actually consult with Gantz during that work to yes. be able to actually get the answers, which is rare for folks doing restoration. Yeah, um, definitely. Which is actually kind of a segue to our next question, because, um, you know, it might seem paradoxical to some of our guests tonight, but this is actually an area of film restoration, which is of a intense interest today and it continues to be of great interest to our students so in recent yes. years we've had a few students who've gone on from Oakland to graduate study in film restoration and preservation um, and our our guest asks uh, if you Andrea could talk about our students and I know that's something you'd love to do and the kinds of careers that they go on to and if I could add a uh, friendly amendment to that question. I'm also eager to hear. I mean, next year we'll be celebrating 40 years of Andrea Ice at Oakland University, which is amazing. And, you know, you have built the film program, you and colleagues have built the film program. So you've watched it evolve over time. Um, I wonder if you could, as you're talking about our students and what they go on to do, also talk about how our program has grown over time as well. Yeah. Well, our students go on to a variety of different careers. I mean, um, some of them are uh, independent filmmakers, and so just making their own films. Some of them work for companies. We have uh, one who went on to work for Disney, is, is still working for Disney. Um, and uh, we have students who went on in restoration, in um, film criticism. Some of them uh, create their own blogs so that they can continue to do film criticism, whether somebody pays them for it or not. Um, <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of them who've stayed around in the area and worked with, even though the incentives are gone, there's still a lot of filmmaking going on in the Detroit metropolitan area. and. Uh, so the students work at, they, we have, um, professional film partner, Michael Manasseri, um, and the Decca brothers who are, uh, resident filmmakers, and they do feature films and commercials and short films and book trailers, which is a new thing that didn't exist not too long ago. And they always have our students working with them and, uh, they, they work as production assistants and many of our students have gone on to work for other filmmakers as a result of working with Michael and the Deccas on uh, on professional sets. They get the experience and they get the networking to send them off to do other, uh, other jobs and on other film sets. Um, I'm sure there are many more. I mean, there are there are people in marketing. There are people in um, uh, who've developed their own film festivals. A really wide range of things that students go on to do. And there are so many careers, different careers, in film and and film production. Um, it's been amazing to me because although film as a, an academic area of, of studies started at Oakland back in the 60s. So that was not new. Um, and uh, when Bob Irwin and Brian Murphy were head of the film program, um, I was very grateful to them for asking me to teach film classes. I was in art and art history and I was teaching photography classes and I started teaching film classes and I actually felt that it was important, which my background as a filmmaker, that students also learn how to make films. Um, at the time it was make videos, we were, we were not, um, there's that differentiation between film and video. I call them films all the time. Others in the department call them videos. Um, and I just thought that even people who were studying film critically could learn so much 
from making their own films, even if they didn't go on to ever make another film after one class. But what I am so enthralled with, with our students, they are inspirational. They are so creative. They are so um, determined and, and, and they have so much energy and excitement about this. They're in it because they want to do it. And they want to uh, get their vision across in film and they want to get their ideas in, in, in the, the critical studies part of it. They want to get their ideas across about, about the importance of film or the, the critical ways you can talk about and look about at film. And I think our students are just amazing. They are so dedicated and committed to uh, their field and so creative and thoughtful and intelligent. And it, I have loved teaching here at Oakland and teaching the students that we get because they're wonderful and they do great things. And, you know, maybe some of you can come to the creative showcase at the end of the, the, uh, the semester where we show off some of the films that our students make and the video essays and the writing, everything. One good plug deserves another, but before I give that next plug, I will also quickly add that our students love you. So uh, I know that's a feeling that, that goes both ways. Um, the, the URL is in the chat, but I want to make sure to encourage everyone to visit Andrea's website, andreaiceart.com. It's ice, E-I-S. Um, and uh, I think that that's as good a place as any to end it. I know we're almost out of time. So if I could invite Catherine back on to take us home. Thank you so much, Andrea and Brendan. It's terrific. I really appreciate you, the insight of both of you. So everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoyed the event and you will join us again in the future. Our next session is Ergonomics for Everyone with Assistant Professor Tara Duisburg on May 4th at 7 p.m. As you sign off, you'll receive a 30-second pop-up survey. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a moment and give us your feedback. Thank you and good night. <laughs>